Just north of Seoul, Allied planes smash Chinese columns massed for an attack a scant thousand yards beyond our main line of defense. Pouring down the historic invasion routes from Munsan and Weijongbu, the Reds try to break through to Seoul. Officers observe the effectiveness of UN air power back in the skies after days of rain as it plasters enemy concentrations building up for their much heralded May Day attack on Seoul. The planes smother the target with machine gun fire, rockets and napalm. During the first few months of 1951, 77 Squadron continued to operate from Airfield K-9 at Pusan, South Korea. The UN forces had been successfully pushing the enemy north, back across the 38th parallel, which included the large parachute drop, Operation Tomahawk. At the same time, the RAAF were bringing in Gloucester Meteors to Japan for the squadron, a long-awaited and very welcome upgrade. Although the Meteor had been in the charge of the RAAF since May 1946, it was not until this year, 1951, that Meteors entered regular service for Australia and through a true baptism of fire. On the 24th of February 1951, the light aircraft carrier HMS Warrior arrived off Iwakuni with 15 Gloucester Meteor Mark 8 jet fighters and two Meteor Mark 7 two-seat jet trainers on her deck. Four experienced Royal Air Force Meteor pilots, led by Flight Lieutenant Max Scannell, were attached to 77 Squadron to test fly the new aircraft and to convert the Australian pilots onto the aircraft. The first RAAF pilot to convert to the new jet was Squadron Leader Cresswell, who had completed a jet conversion course on the F-80 Shooting Star with the USAF during the previous January. I was OK, because I'd, I'd flown with the Americans on the F-80, F the Shooting Star, um, a couple of months before. I had 10 missions on the Shooting Stars too. No, it was a very easy aircraft to convert to. And the RAF sent us out four very good instructors. And um, so we had no trouble. We had two jets, two uh, dual jets, we had no trouble converting the media, not at all. It was a very easy aircraft to fly. We call the gentleman's aircraft. <laughs> um, having two engines didn't make a difference. Being a jet didn't make much difference to blokes with experience. Um, some of the early guys had a bit of trouble. I had a form of what I called an orientation flight at uh, Iwakuni. And that flight was generally commanded by a retiring uh, a pilot from, from the squadron going south. I said, well, spend a fortnight there and teach some of these guys what goes on. That helped a whole lot. And, um, it meant that about the blitz coming from Australia with no meteor experience but had jet experience on vampires could get about uh, up to 20 hours in the meteor before they went into operations. That worked pretty well. During the period 20 April to 20 May, the Communists launched two phases of their expected spring offensive. On 23 April, the Reds jump off on their first phase, hitting strongest above Seoul. UN troops are forced to withdraw south as British and Belgian contingents hold off the Communists in a spectacular rearguard engagement. A secondary action of this phase hits in the Huachan Reservoir area. By 30 April, UN forces cease their withdrawal and set up the Lincoln Defense Line a few miles north of Seoul. In the central sector, UN troops withdraw south of the Pukhan River, and in the east, ROK forces pull back to Yangyang. From 1 May to 16 May, 
there is only minor enemy activity as the communists build up for the second phase and UN forces recover some ground north of Seoul. UN air forces strike at targets of opportunity. The second phase begins on 17 May with the heaviest attack in the central sector southwest of Inji and east of Chonchon. Heavy casualties are inflicted on the Reds in this area. On 20 May, the UN forces shorten their line north of Seoul, strengthen positions in the central sector, and move to plug a gap caused by the collapse of two ROK divisions. On the 5th of May, 77 Squadron's conversion to meteors began in earnest when a program of lectures got underway for both air and ground crew. Due to a lack of two-seat meteor trainers, the two aircraft the squadron did possess were forced to fly constantly to keep up with the hectic pace of the conversion course. By the 2nd of June 1951, the squadron was ordered back to Korea. However, the move was delayed because the USAF insisted that the meteors be fitted with a radio compass before being allowed to fly in Korea. Then, a freak accident left the squadron's engineering staff puzzled. On the 14th of June, Sergeant Tom Stoney had just taken off to conduct an acceptance test flight. A few minutes after takeoff, the ground crew observed Stoney descending by parachute with the meteor flying circles around him. The aircraft flew around him five times, at one stage coming to within 20 feet of him before crashing into a hillside. We, I remember once standing on the strip at uh, Iwakuni and during this conversion period, I think there was one particular aircraft up flying and something went wrong and the pilot was ejected through the accidentally, we think was accidentally, in fact I'm sure it was accidental, um, he, was, he was ejected and went straight through the canopy and I was standing there looking up and I actually saw it happen and I saw the parachute open, the pilot was able to uh, uh, work his parachute and he was coming down quite normally and the aircraft looked like it was under control, under manual control and it was, and it, 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 was, it was descending in a perfect spiral around the pilot coming down like this, in a perfect spiral around the pilot like that. And, uh, that was rather unusual because um, I thought it was being manned. It, we, we had two different types of uh, meteors. One was the single engine fighter and the other one was a, a twin engine trainer. And I thought it must have been one of these twin engine trainers because it was being, you know, it, was, it, it looked as though it was under control. But it wasn't. It was just one of these rare sort of things that happened where the aircraft came down in a perfect spiral, descended in a perfect spiral, very, very close to the, um, to the pilot, all the way down to the ground. Stoney landed safely, but when quizzed about the reason for ejection, claimed that he had not ejected from the aircraft, but that the ejection seat had gone off on its own accord. One minute, he had been leisurely flying along, and a few seconds later, he had found himself hanging from his parachute. The seat was found a few miles from the main aircraft wreckage, but after careful inspection, no reason for the automatic ejection could be found. units push northward along the entire front as the tide of battle changes decisively in Korea. A tank infantry force takes up the pursuit of the exhausted Reds who bogged down in the second stage of their unsuccessful spring drive. The enemy, who has suffered huge losses in men and materiel, is retreating toward North Korean mountain strongholds. Withdrawing along a front of more than 100 miles, Red units find themselves under constant attack from the well-organized UN troops. Enemy lines of supply and communication are placed under continuous aerial and artillery bombardment. By 20 May, the second phase of the Red Spring Offensive has been thrown back along the entire front, with the last gap closed on the Eastern Front near Hangi by 24 May. The UN counterattack is launched immediately, driving the communists in full retreat. 
By the beginning of June, the pursuit, spearheaded by armored columns, has carried the Allies across the 38th parallel into North Korea, where the enemy braces and halts their retreat, forming a defense triangle anchored at Chorwon, Kumwa, and Pyongyang. By 15 June, UN forces crack the heavy red defenses in their so-called Iron Triangle, taking Kumwa and Chorwon and advancing north to Pyongyang. During the week 13 to 20 June, the communist air power becomes more aggressive, but suffers heavy losses to the UN air arm. During this period, the line undergoes minor changes as the ground phase subsides to patrol action and sporadic encounters. By early July 1951, peace negotiations were underway at Kaesong, with UN negotiators traveling from their base at Munsan. Then, on the 21st, the communists called for a recess in the peace talks as they regrouped their armed forces just north of Kaesong. At the end of July 1951, the squadron returned to Korea and settled in at airfield K-14 at Kimpo, north of Seoul. The move was affected by C-47s of the RAAF 30th Transport Unit and C-119s and C-54s of the USAF. The area was a sea of mud as July was the middle of the Korean wet season and as a result, living conditions were very uncomfortable. The airfield was shared with the USAF 8th Fighter Wing who were responsible for providing the Australians with meals and base facilities. The squadron flew its first operational jet mission on Sunday the 30th of July when 16 meteors were tasked to carry out a fighter sweep in the vicinity of the Yalu River. At K-14, the squadron had to produce 18 operational aircraft each morning and evening, and as a result, the ground crews worked long hours to keep the 16 aircraft with two spares on line. Oh, I, I made a combat aircraft. I said, this is going to be a combat aircraft. We'll fly in company with the, the, uh, the American F-86s against the MiG-15. And uh, my idea is pretty sound. The Yanks liked the idea because it gave them some good support too. So it'd be two squadrons of 16 aircraft of, of American Sabres and uh, 12 to 16 meteors behind them. Now, our rate of climb is better than the, the American Sabre. Um, and we also had four good guns, four cannons. But um, Unfortunately, I had left, I was posted um, oh, about three weeks after we introduced the meteor. 77 Squadron suffered its first casualties since converting to jet aircraft on the 22nd of August, when two aircraft collided when returning from a fighter sweep. Sergeant Reg Lamb, a Royal Air Force exchange pilot, and Sergeant Ronald Mitchell were both killed eight miles north of Kimpo. When the Chinese entered the war with the MiG-15, the air superiority of the American-led forces changed dramatically. The MiG-15 had a performance equal to, and in some cases better, than the American Sabre at high altitude, although it had a tendency to enter a spin if not maneuvered carefully at medium altitudes. The first encounter 77 Squadron had with the MiG finally came on the 25th of August, when eight aircraft, providing cover for a USAF RF-80 reconnaissance jet, sighted four MiGs on patrol. Flight Lieutenant Scannell fired at one of the enemy jets at extreme range, but was unable to claim any hits. The MiGs flew back to safety across the Yalu River, where it was forbidden for UN aircraft to fly. Four days later, eight Meteors, led by squadron leader Dick Wilson, were on a routine fighter sweep. He had four aircraft down low, and I had four aircraft down low with him. And then we had eight aircraft flying above us, with the idea being if we were jumped, then they could come down on top of the MiGs. Well, the next thing, Dick Wilson sees a couple of MiGs below him, so he called to, to our eight we, that we were going into attack. Well, as he turned over and started to dive in, I looked around and saw a whole bunch of MiGs sitting on the top of us, of all of us. And uh, as soon as he moved in on this other aircraft, the MiGs got onto him and they uh, caused quite a bit of damage to his aircraft. He was all right. I, when I saw them coming in, I then turned with my four. 
onto no, I had two that would be go born. Two of us, I t got two, one chap and myself, we turned in on the ones attacking Dick Wilson and told him to belt off because he was outnumbered to blow. And we fired on those and then uh, we broke off into another fight, which was there. And at one stage I had a head-on attack with a MiG, which was quite interesting. It was their, their 37 millimeter cannons. Their, uh, the shell coming towards you is like an orange, bright orange. It's uh, 37 mils about that big. You know, it's a fairly big old shell. Uh, the interesting thing was, at one stage during the fight, a meteor passed me, all in flames. Going down, I had a quick look at my map to see what the position was. And Dick Wilson saw a parachute going down. And whether he was on his way back, just as he turned. So he took a position on that. When we got back, the top flight didn't even know they'd lost a meteor. The MiGs had snuck in, got their number four, um, and shot him down. That was Ron Guthrie, who became a prisoner of war. The interesting thing was the position that I had when I got back and the position that Dick Wilson had when he got back were both the same. Yet I saw the flaming aeroplane, <laughs> no parachute. He saw a parachute and no flaming aeroplane. So it shows you what you can see. You know, there's two people virtually in the same area sky. Ron Guthrie became the unwilling creator of a number of world records. He became the first RAF pilot to escape from a jet fighter in combat using the ejection seat. This was one of the highest ejections ever experienced, just below 39,000 feet. The speed of ejection was max 0.84, and his descent, taking almost 30 minutes, were two other world records. Ron describes the moment he was hit. At this instant, I feel as though a load of bricks has fallen onto the rear end of my aircraft, which now shakes convulsively. Explosive shells from another MiG have destroyed my meteor's tail. My aircraft, at this stage merely an uncontrollable mass of MiG meat, begins to snap roll repeatedly. In shock, I prepare to make my first exit in a Martin Baker ejection seat at this great height and over enemy territory. I realize my guns are still firing and release the trigger. The vibrating instrument panel catches my attention and two facts remain in my memory. The clock is reading six minutes past 10 and the Mach meter, my gauge of speed, registers 0.84. As the speed of the dive increases beyond 84% of the speed of sound, the aircraft shudders in compressibility. It continues to roll. It took Ron three attempts to get the ejection seat to fire. He then lost consciousness momentarily. When consciousness returned, he was in a surreal and freezing world, 39,000 feet above a rugged, snow-covered landscape. Squadron leader Dick Wilson had another lucky escape on the 9th of September when a 20mm armour-piercing round hit his cockpit during an attack on ground targets near Pyongyang. The round had entered the cockpit just below the windscreen before breaking up, injuring Wilson in the arm and shoulder. On the 26th of September 1951, a formation of 12 meteors were attacked by a large number of MiGs, diving through the Australian formation and scoring hits on one of the meteors before the pilot had a chance to break. The MiGs bugged out over the Yalu River, but not before Flight Lieutenant Ralph Dawson managed to fire two long bursts of cannon fire into one of the MiGs' wings. Several pilots claimed that they saw fuel streaming back from the MiG as Dawson's cannon rounds impacted into the enemy aircraft, the squadron's first successful jet combat claim. Yeah, the, with the MiGs, they were basically being taught indoctrination. The, the pilots of MiGs were at a low level of training like we might have been at uh, Point Cook in Wurraways or at uh, Williamtown in Meteors, learning the basics of air-to-air -air fighting, which it was air-to-air -air combat um, with those aircraft up at a high level from 35, 40,000 feet. So they were being taught by somebody, probably from, China, um, from Russia, who'd been World War II combat pilots and they were teaching them what the tactics were. So finally, after perhaps a week of training backwards and forwards, showing what was required, 
either two or four would be broken away and led down by an instructor down through us and firing as they came down within range. But they'd keep on going. And we didn't have a hope in hell, as they say, of diving and following them. And we were, at that stage, up near the Yalu River. And the Yalu River was the boundary between North Korea and Manchuria, where they were based. And General MacArthur wanted us to go across into Manchuria and attack their bases. You, we, we could actually see the aerodromes in Manchuria, but we weren't allowed to cross. President Truman said, no, we can't do that. We can't go across. So we were kept across that side. Russian MiG-8, Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Vishnyakov, recalled a dramatic encounter with Australia's 77 Squadron Meteors on the 1st of December, 1951. I opened fire and saw my shell bursts dancing all over the enemy aircraft. Its right engine flamed. I noticed the Meteor wingman's tail flying off as a result of the burst from my wingman. I saw another Meteor leaving the battle. We overtook him and attacked. I managed to frame him in my sights and opened fire. My shells burst on the Meteor's wings and the pilot bailed out. Not only were the Australians outnumbered many times over by the new Russian aircraft, they were outclassed by the new generation jet fighter. It was the skill and experience of the Australians that kept their losses as low as they were as they managed best they could with their Meteors, which were essentially World War II technology. Same thing. We were uh, patrolling at around about 33,000 feet, one lot at 33, one at 29. The Sabres were down around about 25. And the MiGs came up and uh, in great numbers, I think there were about 40 or something like that in the first encounter, and they just got a height advantage, came in, and, uh, and, and blew us out. They, 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 we, we, we broke, but we had no manoeuvrability at that height. So we simply almost fell out of the sky. That's exaggerating it, but we, we were no match. The MiGs came over in great numbers, and we learned later that they were specifically targeting the meteors, knowing that they were inferior in, in performance, and that it would be not too good for morale one way or another. But they would come over in great numbers and we'd, 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 we'd engage in, in combat, lay with us, and there would always be generally four people, four guys staying up top. And they were obviously, well to us they, it seemed pretty obvious that they were Russians and that was confirmed later because there was an entire Russian group there. But they would wait until there was a straggler, in other words a person who was not formed up with the main fight and not with his formation and come down and four of them work him over and attack him. And we figured that they were Ruskies and, and, uh, and that they were pretty competent operators. It happened to me on one occasion. My wingman was shot up and forced out of the fight and I became the straggler. I was way out of the main fight on, on, this, uh, on this occasion. And uh, th these four guys came down and, and worked me over from about 33,000 feet right down to the deck and they were doing that they were employing tactics that we certainly weren't capable of of of, uh, of doing uh, they were very very competent they, they would attack uh, from from a, a, a right rear quarter like that and once I got my turn going in to to, 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 to reduce their capability for deflection there'd be one coming in from here because he's got a no deflection shot I'd break into him and then there'd be one coming from above and I'd break into him and then one from and this went on all the way <laughs> I was pooped by the time I got to the deck I tell you I, I needed to pull 6G all the time because it was 6G at which we figured the, uh, uh, the, the gun sight would no longer compute accurately and that was about the way it was with our gyro gun sight as well so that went on right down to the deck, and of course they couldn't, well, I was, I was amongst the trees, they couldn't stay with me anyway, but, uh, uh, but purely on the count of fuel, they had to bug out and get some height. Uh, in, in, in jets, you need height to, uh, to get reasonable range from your fuel. So that was, uh, that, that was the Ruskies and uh, the, uh, you know, the, way they, the, way, the way they operated. Well, I looked up one day, oh, so, so you could see them taking off, from across the Yellow River, and we were just doing a sweep up and down inside, our, on the outside side of the Yellow River, the borderline. See these fellas taking off, and I thought there's a few of them because they took a while to take off. In fact, 
It was 64. The hell I know this is that given time for them to get to their altitude and with aeroplanes that fly at a height like that, quite often they'll pull contrails, condensation trails. Their method was to fly in pairs, eight pairs, one behind the other, that's 68 to 16, and that was a train, what they called a train, you know, like eight carriages in pairs, making 16. They had four trains, there were 64. Now how I know for certain was you just got a glance and you could see the, the contrails, straight away you, know, you can tell how many. This particular day, we had uh, 16, we had four, four sections of four, 16 and 64 is 80. The Americans came up, they had two squadrons of 12, that's another 24. So you got all these aeroplanes in the sky and you never know, you know what's going to happen next. Uh, whether uh, somehow or other uh, there was no collision despite the fact we had all this aeroplane milling around the sky. On the 1st of November 1951, the squadron was awarded a Korean Presidential Unit citation for exceptionally meritorious service and heroism. Seven days later, an announcement was made that squadron leader Wilson had been awarded the British Distinguished Flying Cross. In an unfortunate incident on the 11th of November 1951, on returning from an aborted fighter sweep along MIG Alley, Sergeant Douglas Robertson suddenly broke formation and collided with Flying Officer Ken Blight. Robertson was killed when his aircraft crashed. Although Blight's meteor had lost four feet off the port wing and was almost unmanageable, he reached the base area by using full port engine power and applying full left rudder. However, the aircraft could not be controlled under 180 knots and Blight ejected. The aircraft crashed in a nearby paddy field, killing a young Korean farmer. 77 Squadron achieved its first confirmed MiG-15 kill on the 1st of December when 12 meteors were engaged by over 50 MiGs in an epic dogfight over Pyongyang. In the opening attack, two meteors were damaged with one forced to return to Kimpo. Flying officer Bruce Gogoli latched onto the tail of a MiG as his cannon fire sent pieces flying from the its fuselage and sending it crashing to the ground in a ball of flame. Several other Meteor pilots managed to hit another MiG, which was also sent crashing to the ground. Ten minutes into the fight, an order was given to break contact and head for home. Three Meteors were found to be missing. It is assumed that the pilots were taken by surprise as they turned for home. Two of the pilots were captured after ejecting, Sergeant Bruce Thompson and Sergeant Vance Drummond. The other pilot, Flight Sergeant Armit, was killed. The squadron had a MiG kill, but had paid a very high price. 